say Scottish Poetry Library really embraced the um, the whole concept and put on some amazing events. So Beth is actually the um, events and volunteers manager at um, the Scottish Poetry Library. So I'm just going to hand over to her and she's going to talk through a little bit about what the events were and, and she's going to also share some poetry with us, which is brilliant. Thanks, Beth. Thank you, Dot. Uh, good morning, everyone, on this very bright and lovely autumn day. I uh, hope you're doing well. Um, before I tell you anything about what we did through the festival or anything about uh, ourselves, I am going to obviously start by reading you all a poem. Um, so this one is called Inferno and it's by a poet called Heather H. Young. Um, she's currently practicing in Scotland. I think she's based in Dundee um, and her work can be found on our website. So if you're interested at all, please just um, log on to scottishpoetrylibrary.org um, and you can find out more about her then. There. Okay. Inferno. In flinty coolness, fire may be found and strength drawn from this fire as it surrounds the stone which, cracking, ruptures nature's bounds, but, crumbled, binds all other stones as one. If, through the furnace, winter's cold embrace and summer's heat, compounded stone lays claim to the divine, as from purgatory's flames, the soul can rise above, adorned in grace. So too, this new desire struck out of strife and drawn through flame and from its ashes, I, rising once more refreshed, can find new life. Thus, phoenix-like, from smur and smoke I fly, first crushed, then tempered by your fiery mould, my soul's wings beaten, not from iron, but gold. Uh, yep, so that's Heather Young, wonderful poet. Um, and I thought it kind of uh, married well with some of the themes from the Firestarter Festival. Um, yeah, so when Dot first came to us, um, chatting about the Fire Firestarter Festival, um, we talked a lot about you know, radical thinking, creativity in the everyday, um, and you know the main theme of celebrating creativity and innovation in the public services. Now, something about the Scottish Poetry Library is, um, I'm sure, of course, you will have all heard of us. Probably not. Somehow people don't know about the Scottish Poetry Library. Um, we're this little library with, I think, 25,000 items in our collection. Um, and we're just based off the Canongate, Gate, um, between the Canongate Gate and um, the Parliament and down in Crichton's Close. Uh, we've been there since 1999. Um, we have a huge programme of poetry events. We run uh, annual publications um, such as Poems for Doctors, Poems for Teachers, and what they are are just little anthologies that we give out to new doctors, new teachers, new nurses, um, with poems that are meant to inspire them um, through their new career and sort of help them um, adjust to new stresses um, that those jobs might entail. Um, those are always really, really popular little publications. Um, so already we've been trying to work into um, the public sector um, and be engaging with different careers and people from different walks of life. Uh, so yes, when Doc came to us, it was absolutely what we wanted to be doing. Um, so at the time, what this was, end of last year, we would have started talking. So, you know, think, pre-corona, um, the Brexit just happening, who knows, time is a funny thing at the moment, isn't it? Um, but I, in my personal life, um, had just finished reading John Burnside's uh, non-fiction book called The Music of Time, uh, Poetry in the 20th Century. Uh, and John was really interested in lots and lots of different things in poetry, but one of those things um, was American poets in the 1960s and how they were involved in America's political life. Um, so thinking about that, it kind of inspired um, what would become our first event. Actually, I think it was our last event, but it's gonna be the first one I'll tell you about, I think. Um, so the story in John's book goes, it's uh, 1960 and John F. Kennedy is just about to be inaugurated. 
and for the first time ever, Kennedy invited along a poet to say a poem uh, at his inauguration. And um, that poet was Robert Frost, uh, who was delighted. Um, slightly older he may have been, he said, no, I can do it, I'm absolutely honored. Um, poetry has such a place in political life. Um, unfortunately, two years after that reading, um, Frost died, but at his funeral, memorial even, um, in 1963, um, John F. Kennedy said this wonderful quote, um, which I'm gonna share with you guys, because it really was the, the little spark um, that sort of ignited into all our events. Um, so that quote goes like this. Robert Frost coupled poetry and power, for he saw poetry as the means of saving power from itself. When power leads man towards arrogance, Poetry reminds him of his limitations. When pa power narrows the areas of man's concern, poetry reminds him of the rich richness and diversity of his existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses. For art re-establishes the basic human truth, which must serve as the touchstone of our judgment. And that couples quite nicely with this idea. Um, I think it was Percy Shelley had said that, uh, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. So it's this idea that the poets and the poetry are always there in the background, um, writing things down, influencing, um, all these things. So um, from there, from that quote, um, we came up with this little panel discussion uh, called When Power Corrupts, which is a quote that you'll recognize from um, what Kennedy said there at the memorial. Um, and this event, I think it took place on the 12th of February, uh, it took the format of a one hour panel discussion with three poets and one chairperson. Um, and we wanted the poets to talk about lots and lots of different things, um, but the sort of kernel of it um, would be, you know, uh, can political poetry go beyond sloganeering? Um, should poets be wary of politicians or, you know, should they be embracing the chance to sort of speak truth to power? Um, what is truth, you know, in, in our media? Who knows? Um, so yeah, it was going to be a really, really interesting event. Uh, we invited along a whole range of poets. Um, so obviously, John Burnside being the inspiration behind the event. Um, poet and theatre maker, Harry Josephine Giles. Uh, their work is, you know, radically, radically left. They're a wonderful poet. Um, performer, theatre maker, art maker. Um, and we also got along Dr. Samantha Walton, um, who is a poet, um, environmentalist, labourist campaigner um, set in the north of England. Uh, chairing the event, we had Henry Bell, who is the, what was his book? The Biography of John McLean, um, the, the labour chap um, from the Clyde Ooh, I don't actually know what when he was alive. Terribly sorry, Henry. Um, but yeah, so as you can see, quite a mix of people. Unfortunately, last minute, John couldn't make it long. Um, he wasn't very well. So we got in Robert Crawford, um, who is a poet and academic from St. Andrews. Uh, the actual event itself uh, is a bit of a blur. I'm terribly sorry. Um, my memory isn't what it used to be. <laughs> um, but yes, it was very good. There was a lot of chat around, um, particularly Ezra Pound, um, which I suppose isn't surprising, you know, Pound being big fascist type. Um, should we still be reading his poetry? Should his poetry still be taught in schools? Um, and it was really interesting to see, uh, to hear Robert Crawford, who's sort of, you know, Pound is a great poet. And then Harry Josephine um, saying, no, we shouldn't be acknowledging that part of history. Um, which made for a very lively debate. Um, and then Sam Walton with a lot of chat about environmental poetry, um, how poetry can be influencing that kind of legislation um, and so on. So it was a really, really, really wonderful event. Um, and I believe somewhere it might be online or it might still be in the Poetry Library archive, um, but I might be able to dig it out and send it along to the Sparkfest team if you're interested. Um, so that was our first event, last event, um, and I'm going to tell you about a series of workshops we did. 
so Dot previously mentioned Ellen Renton, who is an absolutely amazing young poet. Uh, she's based in Edinburgh. She did her um, undergrad literature degree at Glasgow, her creative writing masters at the University of East Anglia. Um, what else does she do? She's part of a spoken word theatre company um, called In the Works. Uh, she's performed two series of shows at the Edinburgh Fringe. Um, and as a poet, she's worked in venues such as the Royal Albert Hall, the Tron and the Scottish Parliament. Um, also festivals including things like uh, Hindor Festival, Last Word Festival, Norwich and Norfolk Festivals. So yeah, she's young, but she's been everywhere and done all the poetry things and she really is amazing. Um, so Dot had brought her along to have a chat with me um, and for us three to sort of put our heads together and work out a way to you know create some really interesting poetry workshops that also embraced um, politics and creativity. Um, so what we eventually came up with was two days, um, two consecutive days at the end of January um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make either of the workshops, but I do have um, insider intel from Ellen herself, um, never fear. So the writing workshops were called uh, Some Kind of Rebel. Um, tagline, can poetry, no, can creativity combat political chaos? It's quite a big question, isn't it? Um, I think, what was it, Auden said that poetry does nothing. Uh, so... Uh, we're against that. <laughs> um, and the quote that this event was built around was George or Orwell saying, it is broadly true that political writing is bad writing. Where it is not true, it will generally be found that the writer is some kind of a rebel. So Ellen wanted to really tap into that idea of making rebellious writing, rebellious words, and reclaiming the power of language um, helping her poets find their inner rebel um, and be able to express that inner rebel in exactly the right words. Um, Ellen wanted me to mention today why she wanted to be uh, involved in the festival in the first place. Um, she'd actually worked very briefly with uh, Dot and the team beforehand. Um, and I think it was at conferences, Helen, Helen, Ellen would um, you know, sit at a table, listen, um, to the chat all day and then write a poem that sort of surmised um, the conversation, the dialogue that happened. Um, and she really, really enjoyed doing that and found it really impactful on her work. And I think she got quite a lot of good feedback for it as well. Um, and she just really enjoyed seeing poetry in a place that you wouldn't usually find it. Um, so she was really, really glad that Dot and the team would like to incorporate poetry into the festival that year and just really wanted to be involved. Um, she thinks it's really important to be encouraging creativity in the workplace and in policy making settings. Um, and also as a, as a creative leader, um, creative workshop leader, um, she was fascinated by the idea of being able to host workshops for people who weren't usually involved in poetry. Um, she was really interested to see what would happen and what the poetry would look like. Uh, would it be different? Um, from her usual poetry crowds. Uh, so yeah, she was all in, she was really excited. Um, and the workshops did indeed go very well. Um, so they were focused political poetry, two consecutive days in the SPL, uh, Scottish Poetry Library. Um, and she began the workshops with some quick exercises um, around uh, George Orwell's essay where the previous quote came from. Um, that essay is called uh, Politics and the English Language. Um, another quote that they were discussing at the start of the workshop um, was from Orwell and reads thusly. This essay describes the muddying of political language as a deliberate act by those in power to confuse and disenfranchise the people. And so according to Orwell, writing about politics in a lively and powerful way is a rebellious act. So by talking about contemporary uh, politics and by expressing them through poetry, they're making the statements understandable to like the layman kind of thing, the ones who don't understand um, political speak um, and popularizing 
um, the truth. Again, what is the truth? Who knows? Um, so yes, Ellen uh, framed the workshop around these quotes um, and really thought about the language that they would be using. Um, the group read and discussed uh, some work by political poets. Uh, one poem in particular, uh, We Lived Happily During the War by Ilya Kaminsky, uh, had a really profound effect um, on the group and led to some really interesting and quite emotional chat. Um, you can find that poem on the Poetry Foundation website um, and it's well worth a look actually if you're interested. Um, both groups um, on both days had a mix um, of um, avid and first-time writers, um, lots of different ages, experiences um, and this brought some really exciting dimensions to the group. Um, the two main writing tasks uh, were based on the idea of reinventing or redefining overused language. So if you think about um, little speech tags that politicians, uh, whether in the States or in the UK, uh, have been using, um, try and imagine those in poems uh, and how much fun you could be having with them. Um, the participants all shared their work uh, with the group and the task produced some really beautiful responses, some of which um, Ellen found out had been developed after the workshop as well. And the participants had actually emailed her the work that came of it. Um, and some of it was really incredible and is finding its way out into the world. So obviously as a workshop leader, that's really exactly what you want to be hearing. Um, and yeah, Ellen got great positive feedback across both groups, really enjoyed herself. Um, and is very much looking forward to next year's uh, Firestarter talk. Um, our final, I think it was final, yeah. Our final um, event with Firestarter Festival um, was the one that I think the SPL was most excited about. As I said at the start, uh, we're always looking for different ways to engage with people who aren't um, traditional poetry folk um, and we do struggle sometimes um, to find um, find ways into uh, different audiences. So with Dot in tow we uh, managed to weasel our way into a wonderful uh, company called Taylor Clark and um, they're a business consultancy based in Glasgow and they reached out to um, Dot and the Firestarter Festival and the Scottish Poetry Library and said, um, in response to an advert that we did, uh, yes, we would love uh, someone from the Poetry Library to come into our office, um, take some of our staff, 12 or 14, I think it was, um, and host a reading workshop. So we were very excited by this. Um, new people, fresh blood. <laughs> Um, so that was really nice that someone was up for it. Um, I'm delighted to say that it was a really great event. Um, we sent our project coordinator, uh, Dr. Samuel Tung, um, across to Glasgow, um, where he hosted uh, a reading workshop that we call Nothing But The Poem. So Nothing But The Poem is um, a poetry library uh, firm favourite. Uh, we've been doing them for years. We used to run them every Saturday morning. Um, unfortunately, since COVID, we've had to move them online. Um, so we've been doing these little reading workshops every two weeks online via Zoom, as everyone has been. Um, and what the format for these events are is the facilitator, so Sam in this case, uh, would choose a poet. Um, they'll then choose three poems. Um, the participants come along um, and we take one poem at a time. We have a volunteer read the poem then the whole group discuss that poem. And then the, another volunteer, no, the same volunteer will read that poem again, um, just to see how, you know, their response and the way they read uh, the poem has changed after the conversation. So they do it for each poem, chat a little bit about the poet. Um, and it's generally just a really, really lovely hour because um, you don't need any experience in reading or writing poetry. You just come along, listen to a nice poem, have some great chat, cup of tea, it's really, really nice. Um, and we are really missing them actually. Um, it's been great to see them on Zoom. You know, we've had people from you know, Inverness to Cornwall uh, get involved, but you know, there's nothing really like having a biscuit with your poetry friends, is there? Um, 
so yes, uh, we sent Sam across to Taylor Clark um, and he chose to read uh, Edwin Morgan um, as his poet. The reasoning behind that was Edwin Morgan was, he was radical for his time. He wrote everything from sonnets to concrete poetry. Um, indeed, was one of the, the foremost writers of concrete poetry back in the day, um, sort of in the late 60s when, when it was really first a, a thing. Um, he was our first Scots Macker uh, back in 2004. Uh, much like Frost, uh, he read a poem at the Scottish Parliament um, building unveiling. I think there might be a grave, an engraving of it in the wall somewhere actually. But I need to check that, apologies. Um, so yeah, Edwin Morgan, uh, radical in his own way, um, was a translator of uh, Hungarian, Russian, Italian, Latin, Old English, he's just an amazing man. Um, and obviously he, he led a lot of his life um, as a closeted gay man um, and then coming out and you know that was very radical for the time and he was just fantastic, absolutely inspirational. Um, Thankfully, one of uh, Sam's poems um, from Edwin Morgan uh, is the poem Strawberries. So Sam chose to read Strawberries um, as his first poem at Taylor Clark Consultancy. And I'm actually going to share that one with you just now, um, just because I really like it. It's a really nice poem. It's a Wednesday morning. We all need a little pick me up. Why not? Um, so you can also find this one on our website um, if you look at scotchpoetrylibrary.org.uk and then look for Edwin Morgan. So here we go. Strawberries. There were never strawberries like the ones we had that sultry afternoon, sitting on the step of the open French window facing each other. Your knees held in mine, the blue plates in our laps, the strawberries glistening, in the hot sunlight. We dipped them in sugar, looking at each other, not hurrying the feast, for one to come the empty plates laid on the stone together with the two forks crossed. And I bent towards you, sweet in that air, in my arms, abandoned like a child. From your eager mouth, the taste of strawberries, in my memory, lean back again, let me love you. Let the sun beat on our forgetfulness. One hour of all, the heat intense. The summer lightning on the Kilpatrick Hills. Let the storm wash the plates. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, I think it is one of my favorite poems. It's definitely one of my favorite Morgan poems anyway. Um, it's actually his centenary this year. Um, if you're interested. So it would have been 100 back in April. Um, there was lots of celebrations planned, but unfortunately a lot of them have been cancelled, but it's maybe worth looking um, up the Edwin Morgan Trust um, if you're interested in finding out more. They'll probably still be running online events to celebrate the centenary. But anyway, back to our Nothing But Poem at Taylor Park. So we sent Sam all the way over to Glasgow, um, back when you could do such lovely things. Um, and Sam read some Edwin Morgan, um, had some great chat. Um, the workshop was full. He was very, very pleased to see um, and got some wonderful feedback. Um, and actually Taylor Clark have published a blog about the workshop, which we were so pleased to see. Um, and I'm just gonna share that with you now. Um, so this is from one of the Taylor Clark employees that uh, took part in the workshop. There is no right or wrong way to interpret poems, Sam told us. Poems are open for each of us to respond to and make our own meaning from their words, rhythm and rhyme. Afterwards, we considered how we use poetry and storytelling in our work with leaders as coaches and facilitators. So that was really important to us, um, getting people to think about how they can um, take what they've learned from the workshops and take what they've learned about poetry and actually put it into practice um, in their everyday life. Um, so that was really important. We were so pleased to see that. Um, the blog goes on to say, uh, the session initially, initially evoked for me school English lessons uh, and striving for the obscured meaning which I was failing to find. However, 
When I listened to other stories of interpretation, I gained a much richer and deeper understanding of the poems from different perspectives. I'll pause again here. Um, it is definitely worth noting that uh, high school teachers, God bless them, wonderful bunch, but the curriculum does not allow them to teach good poetry. Um, and I firmly believe that. Uh, I didn't like poetry until about three years ago when I started uh, working at the Poetry Library, because, you know, you read the same, you know, you read um, Edwin Muir, uh, Wilfred Owen, Caroline Duffy, you read the same poems over and over. You've got to memorise them. No one wants to do that. Um, and it doesn't really explore the joy of poetry. So that's something that nothing but the poem uh, is meant to do. Um, it's meant to show you that poetry isn't like high school English. Um, you don't have to be checking off the rhythm and rhyme schemes. Um, what's more important is reading the poem, taking pleasure from the poem. Um, and you know, working out your perspective on things. Um, poetry can teach empathy, much like storytelling. Um, and the blog goes on to continue. Um, it occurred to me how understanding poetry is like understanding people. Other people's words and behaviours can be confusing and can generate strong reactions and emotions in us. Even when we try our best, we sometimes don't understand them. Yet, if we open ourselves to listening to others' perspectives and interpretations, we can help each other gain richer and deeper appreciation of those around us. So again, it's this idea that poetry can teach empathy, it can teach perspective, um, and is generally the best. Um, so Taylor Clark, we're super pleased with Sam. Um, he did get invited back, but alas, COVID. Um, but we'll be looking at uh, partnering with them again in the future, uh, whether it's in real life or online remains to be seen. Um, and if you know anyone who would be interested uh, in having their business or even charity, whatever, um, have a nothing but the poem session, uh, given to them please you know get in touch uh, you can find my email on the poetry library website um, and I actually asked Sam to give me a little bit of his feedback as well and um, so that we've got some from the participants and from the facilitator of the workshop um, and the main things uh, that Sam remembers as the takeaway was uh, it was such a good thing to do to get um, a non-poetry setting talking about poetry. And I keep coming back to this, um, this idea that, you know, poetry isn't for me, or, you know, I don't know anything about poetry. Um, how would it, you know, help my daily work life? Um, but no, people, Sam says, were very, very surprised by how impactful it was um, on everyday experiences and how accessible it can be uh, with the right poems and with the right people. Um, and the workshop it took some people back to actually reading for pleasure, um, which is a pretty lovely, wholesome thing. You know, it's really good for mindfulness. You're sitting and it's just you and the page. Uh, you've got that focus. You can't be thinking about the to-do list or whatever annoying things happened at work that day. You've got to be focused. Um, and that's just really good for your mental health. Um, so you've got the well-being aspect, um, but also poetry can be really silly. Um, so after my chatting to you today, I want you to all go and look up uh, Edwin Morgan's Loch Ness uh, Monster Song, um, which Sam had read to this particular Nothing But The Poem group. Uh, and it's a poem without traditional words. Um, it's just a bunch of noises, basically, and it's meant to be the Loch Ness Monster uh, trying to talk to us and trying to communicate with us. And the chats around that poem are absolutely fascinating because people really read into it. You know, there's no language. Um, we don't know the Loch Ness Monster, so we've got no context. Um, so it's absolutely fascinating to hear, fascinating to hear what people uh, make of essentially um, a stream of uh, vowels and consonants. Uh, so yeah, have a look uh, if you've got the time. Um, also, uh, Sam mentioned that the workshop was a way of talking about emotions without having to fess up in front of the boss. Um, so yeah, it's good for emotional connections uh, with the people around you as well. Um, and that's quite important in work, I think. It's been a long time since I saw my colleagues, so who knows? <laughs> um, so yeah, that was the end of our Firestarter 
uh, festival poetry strand. Uh, we did a lot. It was a lot in, in two weeks and it was just so much fun. Uh, the support we got from Dot and the team was incredible. Um, Taylor Clark lot, incredible. The audience we got for the When Power Corrupts um, event, I think we'd sold out. Um, we have a capacity of 60, 60 seats. Um, so that was wonderful. Um, and obviously the workshops that Ellen was leading um, have found life elsewhere. Um, and can, the work has continued even after those workshops. So that's, you know, the best thing that could have happened for us really. Um, and having Taylor Clark uh, invite Sam back at some point, whenever it may be, uh, really means the world to us. Uh, it means we're doing our job right. Um, it means Firestarter Festival is really making a difference. Um, so, you know, thank you to Dot and the team for um, having us along um, and allowing us to be part of an absolutely wonderful festival. Um, and I think that's probably all for me. Um, I'm going to read you a final poem, um, if that's okay. It's a good one. It's uh, They're all good ones, of course. Um, this one's by Michael Peterson, who is a poet practicing in Edinburgh at the moment. Um, he runs a, a big spoken wordy art, music, um, record label publisher, um, company called Noiriki. He does that with Kevin Williamson. Um, they're amazing. They're based at Summerhall. Uh, check out their work um, if you've got time. Um, so this poem by Michael is also on the Scottish Poetry Library's website. So if you're interested in rereading it, uh, have a look there um, and find out some more if you like. Um, and the poem is called Hello, I am Scotland. Who wakes every morning in a brilliant mood as auburn bursts, cast filigree nets over foreheads and swing parks and paint themselves on pavements? Up gets the brickworks, frost needles arms, winds shriek through my Munros, gossiping as another small dug sinks deep into the snow and the day floats down like a feather from the sky. Ah barks a father's voice caught in the breeze. Let him sing his song and paint whatever it is he cares to paint. I have a soft spot for daft romantics and who wouldn't he grasp for it when it really could be. My cities breathe in the rivers, salute the environmentalists, snail savers, wall walkers, ally of elm and ash. Every day, my oceans swallow 500,000 footprints, strangle gulls in fitted laughter, emit the salty corpse, sea splash spears a drunken busker mixing up his cluster chords. I, too, forget such simple things. Perhaps I've never known all the numbers of the buses and their routes, the vagaries in roadworks, but I do remember bonfires in all them bellies as whole families politicised breakfast over toasted soldiers and eggs unfit and fit for dipping. We jumped without parachutes, so they'd have you think, skirted around each other's glances like window cleaners avoiding a high up mucky splodge. It wasn't that at all, more a faith in flying. So yeah, thank you for having me along, everyone. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the events today. Uh, cheers. Thank you so much, Beth. That was absolutely brilliant. It's just such a great start to the day. And uh, just, it just was amazing what you, you kind of pulled out from Scottish Poetry Library for the Firestarter Festival. And it's just great to hear how it's, it's continued to kind of rip along. So, so I look forward to, to more kind of collaborations in the future. Thanks very much. That was that was just brilliant. Thank you.